Now I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter number 1. We're going to read one verse, verse number 16. The Bible says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, comma, of whom was born Jesus, comma, who is called Christ. Now again, the scripture says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, comma, of whom? Who? Mary. Not Mary and Joseph. Of whom Mary was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And I'll expand on that in a moment, but let's pray. Father, we bless you. We certainly thank you for being our Savior. We're thankful for the matchless grace, the wonderful grace of Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, that you being the light, when we believed on thee, we became the light of the world, and we can keep the lower lights burning. And Lord, we are thankful for Calvary, because after we went to Calvary, we've never been the same. Now, Father, I pray you'd be with those that are sick and those special prayer requests. I pray that, Father, you would be with those that are providentially hindered, those who are struggling. I pray you'd help them. I pray that, God, you would uh, sit down amongst us tonight. And, Lord, you would reveal yourself in an intimate and powerful way to each and every one that are hearers from the Word of God. Lord, I'm thinking right now about those Emmaus Road disciples and how you began in the scriptures at Moses and taught them all things concerning yourself. And Lord, they said their hearts did burn within them. And Father, I pray tonight that you'd help me to be the mouthpiece, but you'd do the speaking, and our hearts would burn within us, hearing you expound on you. And God, we would truly have a greater appreciation for our darling Savior. Now, I pray if there be any amongst us tonight unsaved, God, you'd save them. I pray if there be anybody cold and indifferent on God, they'd get right with the Lord. I pray that God revival would break out in our hearts and then would break out in our church and then break out, Father, in this community. I pray you'd be glorified and magnified so greatly that many would come to Christ. Now, Father, I pray for those that are watching via live stream, you'd bless them. And I certainly do pray that you'd bless these in the sanctuary tonight. Use this unworthy vessel. Help us, Lord, from the word of God, and we'll be quick to bow these unworthy heads and bless your holy name for what great things you do. Have your will and way now. Thank you for allowing us to be in church. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Here we find that Jesus was born of Mary, who is called Christ. And tonight, I want to try to answer the question of who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? There are some that will say he was a great man, and he was. There are some that will say he was a great prophet, and he was. There are some that will say he was a religious leader, and he was. And there are some that will say that he was all kinds of things, but what is most important and who is most important to listen to is what God said about it. So who is Jesus? First of all, the word Jesus means Savior. His very name means Savior. The first time the name Jesus was ever spoken, an archangel spoke it to where human ears heard it. He was... Uh, uh, so divine that even a, a man couldn't come up with his name. His name means Savior. In this verse, we find that he is called Jesus, uh, and he was called Christ. The name Christ means the anointed one. So he is the Savior, and he is the anointed one. Let me help you something. You don't need to look to anyone else. There's none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved uh, than the name of Jesus. Uh, he is the one to look to. Uh, you don't need to look to Buddha. Buddha's still in the grave. He can't redeem you. You don't need to look to Muhammad. Muhammad can't redeem you. Uh, you don't even have to look to Mary. She cannot redeem you. Uh, the only one that can redeem you is Jesus Christ. Uh, can I say he is the central 
and main theme of the entire Bible. You'll find him on every page uh, if you look for him. Who is Jesus? Can I say, first of all, Jesus is God. I make no apologies for that. I'll say it again. He is God. The triune God is made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. There are three who agree in one. And Jesus, the Son of God, is God. Can I say John chapter number 1, verse number 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. If you got the right Bible, let's capitalize. It's talking about the living Word. His name is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, again capitalized, uh, was with God, uh, and the Word was God. He's God. Who is He? He's God. Hmm. Can I say something else? Uh, everything said about God in the Old Testament is also said about Jesus in the New Testament. Let me give you some examples. There are some titles in the Old Testament referring to God the Father, God Jehovah. They're also referred to Jesus, God the Son, uh, in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in Psalms uh, 136 and verse 3, you find the title Lord of Lords, referring to Jehovah God, the Father. Mm, you see uh, uh, the same uh, term, Lord of Lords, referring to Jesus Christ in Revelation 19.6. Uh, he's God. In uh, 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 Isaiah eight thirteen through 15, you find Jehovah God uh, referred to as the stone of stumbling. And again, Jesus Christ, the same term is used for him in 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. You find the title creator uh, referring to Jehovah God in Isaiah 44, 24. Uh, and again, in Colossians 1, 16, you find Jesus Christ... Uh, is the creator. Uh, uh, you find uh, the title King of Kings uh, assigned to Jehovah God in Psalms 95 and 3. Uh, and can I say in 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 15, uh, you find Jesus Christ uh, is the King of Kings. Uh, who is Jesus? He's God. Uh, and uh, uh, you find the talfa, title Alpha and Omega in Isaiah 44, 6, referring to Jehovah God. Uh, and in Revelation 1, 8, uh, you find Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. He's God, friend. Uh, hey, you find the title Good Shepherd uh, in Isaiah 40 in verses 10 through 11, uh, referring to Jehovah God. Uh, and in John chapter number 10, verse 11, you find Jesus is the Good Shepherd. Uh, he's God. Uh, uh, you find the term Every Knee Shall Bow uh, in Isaiah 45, 23, uh, uh, before Jehovah God. Uh, and then in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, uh, you find Every Knee Shall Bow and Every Every tongue will confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, he is God, friend. Uh, hey, in Isaiah 24, 20, and 21, uh, you find Jehovah God is the judge. Uh, but in Hebrews 12, 23, uh, you find that Jesus uh, is the righteous judge. Uh, and then in Isaiah 24, 23, uh, you find Jehovah God is the reigning God. Uh, and then in Matthew 25, 35, uh, 31, uh, you find Jesus Christ. Christ uh, as the reigning God. Uh, hey, He is God, my dear friends. Uh, let me give you some further proof. Uh, 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 the Old Testament prophets foretold that Jesus Christ would be God. You find that in Isaiah 7, 14. You find it in Isaiah 9, 6. Uh, and you find it in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. Uh, uh, you find uh, uh, the Scripture, uh, Christ was pro proclaimed to be God at His birth. Uh, 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 you find that uh, in Matthew 1, 23. Uh, you find it in Luke 1, 17, Luke 1, 32, Luke, Luke 1, 36, uh, uh, Luke 1, 76. Uh, and in Luke 2, 11, uh, uh, you find the angel himself proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, he was proclaimed to be God at His birth. Uh, the Old Testament foretold that He would be God. Uh, 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 we find that Jesus claimed that He was God. Uh, and He even accepted worship from men, uh, being the God of glory. Uh, Matthew 2.11, Matthew 8.10, uh, Matthew 9.18, uh, Matthew 14.33, uh, Matthew 15.25, uh, Matthew 20.20, 20, uh, Matthew 28.9, uh, Mark 5.6, uh, 
Luke 24, 52, John 9, 38, John 10, 30 through 33, John 5, 18, John 8, 56, 59, John 9, 38, John 20, 28, Jesus said He was God because He is God. Who is Jesus? He's God, my dear friends. And when men would proclaim and bow before Him and worship Him as God, He inhabited their praise. He's God. Can I say the New Testament writers said that Jesus is God. You find uh, uh, it written in Acts 20, 28 that He's God. Uh, Acts 10, 36 that He's God. Uh, Philippians 2, 6 that He's God. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 that He's God. Uh, Colossians 2, 9 that He's God. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17 that He's God. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 16 that He's God. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16 that He's God. Uh, Hebrews 1 and 3 that He's God. Uh, uh, Titus 2, 13 that He's God. Uh, and 1 John John 3.16 says He's God, my dear friends. Uh, who is Jesus? He's God. Can I say 663 times in the New Testament Jesus is called Lord. You say, huh? Uh, uh, but that's just your opinion. You're the one that's saying He's God. Well, let me t tell you some of the names of those in the Bible that said He was God. Hmm? Can I say David said He was God? Hmm? Isaiah said he was God. Jeremiah said he was God. Uh, Matthew said he was God. Uh, there were angels dispatched to earth that proclaimed him as God. Uh, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, proclaimed him as God. Uh, hey, John proclaimed him as God. Uh, hey, the blind man proclaimed him as God. Uh, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Uh, Peter called him God. Uh, Paul called him God. Uh, and the heavens opened up uh, and God the Father looked down and said, this is my beloved Son. Uh, God called him God. Uh, who is Jesus? He's God. Who is Jesus? He's God. Mm, but He's much more than that. He's not only God. He's the God-man. Let me say that again. He's the God-man. He was all God, and He was all man. Say, so explain that. I can't. But I believe it because that's what the Bible teaches. He was all God, yet He was all man. He was tempted in all points like as you and I, but yet He was without sin. Because God can't be tempted with evil. He was tempted in His flesh, but Him being God didn't sin. He is all God and all man. Let me give you a few verses. Listen to the verse. And it's dealing with the one who's all man, yet He's all God. In Mark 15, 39, the Bible says, And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Maybe the very one that nailed him to the cross, Brother Brian. Maybe Brother Peter is the very one that planted the crown of thorns upon his head. Maybe Brother Bob, the very one uh, 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 that uh, 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 cast lots for his garment and got his robe. Uh, but one of those centurions that was there for those six horrible day, uh, hours that day on Calvary, uh, 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 when Jesus uh, uh, cried, Emi Lee, Emi Lama Sabachthani, and he gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. A man who has made his living about torturing people and mm, causing them to die the way of the crucifixion, who had seen many people die, many people on a cross. Never seen anybody like this man, because this man's the God man. Matthew said in Matthew 12, verse 8, For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. Luke 2, 22, 69 says, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. He's the God-man. He was man, yet he was God. 
Now, let's talk about the God man. He was all God, yet he's all man. Can I say this? He was born of a virgin. And the only way he could have been a God man is if his father was God and his mother was of the human race. He was born of a virgin. Look at verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. It said, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, that word espouse is what we would use today as being engaged. But it was a whole lot different, Brother Tony, because back in those days they had arranged marriages. Joseph's father and Mary's father came into agreement. And uh, 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 Mary's father said, I'll let your son have my daughter to be his wife for a certain price. Now, unlike today, Brother Donald, where... Young people go out and they date and they court and they see if they like each other's personality and see if uh, they think they'll make a good match for one another and they spend some time together and then they could go ahead and pop the question and get engaged and then have the big ceremony and go to the drive through and get Elvis marry him like you all did down there in Tennessee. That's not what happened in Bible days. They didn't date. They didn't court. They didn't even have a say-so. The way it worked, Brother James, is the agreement would be made between the fathers. And then the son would have to build a place for his new bride. And when he built it under the father's specification, because the father entered in the contract of the father of the little maid that's going to marry him, when the place was... Uh, uh, fit for a bride he would show it to his father and his father said that'll suffice go get your bride and he could go get his favorite camel head out uh, go get his bride uh, Miss Mary didn't matter if it's in the middle of the afternoon uh, didn't matter if it's in the evening uh, didn't matter if it's in the middle of the night uh, he could go get his bride catch her away take her back to his place uh, and make her his wife how it happened. Now get a hold of this. One of these days, Jesus come for his bride. He just wait for the Father to say, everything's been met to my specifications. Go get your bride. All right? And he's going to catch us away. Somewhere it's going to be new time. Somewhere it's going to be evening time. Somewhere it's going to be in the middle of night. Hey, all that matters, you better be ready. He's a coming. There was a contract between two fathers. And we find here that she is espoused to Joseph. If we had time, we'd read it. In Luke 1, we find the Holy Ghost comes to Mary and says, Thou art favored among women. Blessed art thou. You're going to have the Son of God. She says, how can this happen seeing I have not known a man now in the biblical form that means she had never been with a man intimately and the angel tells her the Holy Ghost shall overshadow thee and that uh, which you uh, uh, conceive will be of God well back in those days Miss Mary unlike today Today we live in loose societyville. In those days, if a young lady was with child before she got married, they took her outside the city and they stoned her. They made an example of her to other young ladies that you keep yourself chaste for your soon-to-be husband. Well, the same Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary, and she went and told Elizabeth, she was going to have God's son. And Elizabeth was excited because her and her husband hadn't had, Zacharias hadn't had, been able to have a child, and they was up in age. Uh, and she was carrying, uh, 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 she's about five months pregnant. Uh, and uh, when her mama, uh, uh, when the mama Elizabeth says to Mary, uh, 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 their cousin, when she says, hey, hey, that's of God. God's, uh, uh, you're having the son of God. Uh, the boy in her womb leaped. We know he's John the Baptist. 
For the same Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary realized what would happen to Mary. So he reveals himself to Joseph and said, Joseph, she's with child, but don't worry. That's of God. You take her to yourself, appears to him in a dream, and tells him, and you call him Jesus. Hmm? You say, what happened? Joseph, being a respectful man who was a God-fearing man, took her to be his wife anyway. What a blessing. So let's read this verse now. Once you understand it, I had to throw all that out there. It was nowhere in my notes. Now we're at 10 pages of notes, Dad. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Notice it didn't call Joseph his father. <laughs> Look at this next line. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Mary was a virgin. His mother was a virgin. That's so important because a child gets his blood from the father. We don't have time to get into it, but we were saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If His blood was earthly blood, my dear friends, He could not be our Savior. But because His blood was eternal blood from the uh, glory world, uh, His was godly blood, it was red, royal, redeeming blood, He could become our Savior. Uh, we'd have time, we don't have time, we go into the Old Testament realize... Uh, the only way uh, uh, somebody could redeem somebody else, you had to have a kinsman redeemer. In other words, he had to become like us so we could become like him one day. Mm -mm. What a blessing that he was born of a virgin. Now let me just throw this out. It just came to me. It's not in my notes, but I'm not going to charge anything extra for it. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Notice it said before they came together. Notice it didn't say they would never come together. I could take you over to Mark and show you Jesus had stepbrothers and stepsisters. Hmm? Huh? Matter of fact, one of his stepbrothers, James, was a great preacher. You're welcome. It didn't cost you anything extra. There are people who say she was a perpetual virgin. Liar, liar, pants on fire, because the Bible teaches different. Huh? We find he's the God-man. He was born of a virgin. Can I say something about it? He had a human ancestry. You read the first chapter of the book of Matthew. You'll find all the people that were on Joseph's lineage and Mary's lineage. You'll find that. You'll find uh, 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 also uh, 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 in other places where it tells who he... You can go back to 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. You'll find that he came from David. You'll find that he'll sit on David's throne because he is of... Uh, uh, the offspring of David. Uh, it's amazing, though, if you go back and you study this. If I had time, I'd look at this ancestry with you. There's a lot of great people in his ancestry, but then you got you got uh, uh, some that aren't. You know, he had a harlot in his ancestry. You know, if I was going to make out the and this, is how you know, man didn't write the Bible. I mean, if I wrote, I mean, they'd be all blue bloods. You know. You know, it'd be Daniel and David and all these, you know, lion's den guys and Hebrew and the fiery furnace guys. I mean, I'd, I'd be getting the heroes. I wouldn't be having no harlots in there. Hmm. You say, why was that in his lineage? Because he came for everybody. Hmm. He had human ancestry. Can I say this? He had human characteristics. The Bible makes it clear he hungered. He's the God man, but he got hungry. The Bible makes it clear he got thirsty. When he's on the cross, he cried out, I thirst. The Bible makes it clear he got wearied. He also slept when he's on the boat. The Bible makes it clear he had compassion on people. He became angry, and yet he sinned not. Hmm? He grieved the death of Lazarus. Hmm? He trusted in the Father's will. We find he prayed. Why would God have to pray? To be an example to us that we should pray. Huh? He wept.
when he died. He had human characteristics. He was man, and he was God. Who is Jesus? He's God. He's the God-man. I've got to speed it up now because Dad's got me on a clock back there. Uh, let me give you this. Who is Jesus? He was prophesied about in the Bible. We used to have a track. I wish I had some more of them. I need to order some. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus, but this track said if you just take eight, and it mentioned what eight they were, said the odds of one man fulfilling those eight prophecies, you could take silver dollars and they would be knee high and they'd cover the entire state of Texas. That would be the odds. It was one in 250 with a bunch of zeros behind it. But Jesus didn't just fulfill eight prophecies about himself. He fulfilled them all. Now let me give you some prophecies about him. His birth was foretold in Micah 5.2 and Isaiah 7.14. By, by being foretold, it told the place, it told, you know, the events, and told all about what would happen, even the timing. Huh? His life was foretold. And I tell you, the Bible makes it clear about his preaching and healing. You find that in Isaiah 61 and 1. Uh, uh, you find that uh, the Bible makes it clear he'd be rejected in Isaiah 53, 2 and 3. You'd find about him entering Jerusalem uh, and being heralded in Zechariah 9, 9. His death was foretold. Uh, you find that his betrayal by a friend found in Psalms 41 and 9. You find that there would be a perversion of justice in Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. By the way, the Jews broke every law in their books, trying him at night and the way they crucified him. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, the crucifixion was foretold in Psalms 22, verses 4 and 16. Uh, the words that he'd speak on the, on the cross was uh, uh, prophesied in Psalms 22 and 1. Uh, you'd find the mocking crowd in Psalms 22, verses 6 through 8. Uh, you'd find they'd cast lots for his garments in Psalms 22 and 18. Uh, you'd find about out about his vicarious suffering in his Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 6. Uh, you'd find that not a bone of him would be broken in Psalms 22. 22 and 17 uh, and you find that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb in Isaiah 53 and 9 all these were prophecies about the Lord uh, you find his resurrection was foretold uh, in Psalms 16 and 10 uh, and you find that his ascension was foretold in Psalms uh, 1 and 10 verse number 1 uh, all these prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ and others I, I'm just trying to hit the highlights because I mean how do you tell all about when the whole book's about it hmm? Who is Jesus? He's God. He's the God man. He's the Savior. He's the anointed one. Mm -hmm. Can I say the Bible said that when he saw all things were fulfilled, he gave up the ghost. You see, he had to fulfill everything that was prophesied about him in order to become what the Word of God said he would be. Uh, can I say he's referred to by many names? in the scriptures uh, can I say I'm just going to highlight some of them but I find that his names are to assure us that he's everything we need can I say he's the, our advocate can I say he's almighty he's alpha and omega he is the amen He's the Ancient of Days. He's the Anointed of the Lord. He's the Arm of the Lord. He's the Author and Finisher of our faith. Uh, he's the Beginning and the End. Uh, he's the Beloved of God. Uh, he's the Blessed and Only Potentate. Say, Preacher, why don't you bow down and kiss the Pope's ring? There's only one Potentate, uh, and His name is Jesus. Uh, 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 can I say this? Uh, he's the Branch of Righteousness. Uh, he's the Bread of Life. Uh, He's the bridegroom. Uh, he's the bright and morning star. Uh, he's the captain of our salvation. Uh, he's the chief cornerstone. Uh, he's the chief shepherd. Uh, he is Christ. Hallelujah. Uh, hey, he's the consolation of Israel. Uh, he's our counselor. Uh, he's the day spring. Uh, he's the day star. Uh, he is deity. He's God. Uh, he, he's the deliverer. Uh, he's the diadem. Uh, he's the door uh, to heaven. Uh, hey, he is Emmanuel uh, with an E and an I. Uh, hey, what a blessing. Uh, he's the ensign of the people. Uh, he is eternal life. Uh, he's the everlasting Father. Uh, he's faithful and true. Uh, he's the first begotten of the dead. Uh, 
He's the first fruits. Uh, he's the first and the last. Uh, he is our foundation. Uh, he's a friend of sinners. Hallelujah. Uh, he's the glorious Lord. Uh, he's God. Uh, I said He's God. Hallelujah. Uh, he's Almighty God. Uh, hey, He's the good master. Uh, he's the governor. Uh, he's the great high priest. Uh, he's the great shepherd. Uh, he's the head of the church. Uh, he's the heir of all things. Uh, he's the Holy One. Uh, he is the hope of glory. Uh, he's the horn of salvation. Uh, he's the husband. Uh, hey, he's the I am uh, that I am. Uh, he's the image of God. Uh, his name is Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Uh, hey, he's the judge. Uh, he's the king of glory. Uh, he's the Lamb of God. Uh, he is life. Uh, he is light. Uh, and he's the lily of the valleys. Uh, He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the living bread. He's the living stone. He's Lord. I said He's Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, He's the man of peace. He's the man of sorrows. And He is Master. He's the mediator. He's the messenger of the covenant. He's the Messiah. He's the mighty God. He's the minister of the sanctuary. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's the only wise God. He's our Passover. He's our peace. He's the great physician. He is the power of God. He's the priest. He's the prince of peace. He's prophet. He's our propitiation. He's the purifier and refiner. He's rabbi. He's ransom. He's a redeemer. He is the resurrection and the life. He's the righteous servant. Hey, he's the rock of ages. Hey, he's the rod of the stem of Jesse. He's the root of David. And he's the rose of Sharon. He's the ruler. He's salvation. He's savior. He's scepter out of Israel. He's the second Adam. He's the seed of David. Hey, he's the shepherd of our souls. He's the son of David. He is the son of God. He's the son of man. He is our source. He's the sower. He's the stone. He's the son of righteousness. He's the teacher come from God. He's the tried stone, the true vine. He is the truth. He is the unspeakable gift. He is the way. He is wonderful. He is the Word. He's the Word of God. And He is the Word of life. That's just a handful of the names He's called in the Bible. I have a series by C.J. Rawls. It's seven books just with about His names. Uh, hey, there's just something about Him. Who is Jesus? He is the A and the Amen and everything in between. Huh? Uh, let me tell you about his ministry. What about his ministry? We have four books in the Bible on his ministry. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, you've got you to keep this in mind about Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, you find he's a young child. And the wise men come to behold him, and they bring him the gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And again, I know I bust your bubble every Christmas. That didn't happen at the manger. Calls him a young child. He's not the babe at the manger. And Herod gets word there's a king in Israel. And so you have the slaughter of the innocents. And every young child uh, uh, under the age of two is slaughtered. Well, the Lord warns Joseph, Joseph and Mary take Jesus and head off to Egypt. We know at some point they come to Nazareth. And we don't know much more about Jesus till he's 12 years old. And when he's at 12 years old, uh, they come for the Passover feast to Jerusalem. And while they're with a great company that came from Nazareth there at Jerusalem, uh, uh, you find Jesus in the temple. And all the scholars, all the scribes, uh, all the Sanhedrin council, the high priests, they're all there. And here's this 12-year-old boy named Jesus. Uh, and they begin to ask him questions. Uh, and he begins to answer them. And he's asking them questions they can't answer them. He's dumbfounding the scholars. I mean, he's only the Lord of glory. 
You say he's a 12-year-old boy. Well, that's what the outside looks like. But he's the alpha inside. Hmm? Well, uh, 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 you know what happens is Mary and Joseph start heading back to Nazareth, get a whole day's journey. They got all them other youngins by now. And they would get to look around, where's Jesus? So I have to go back to Jerusalem. Mary finds him in the temple. Where else are you going to find him? Huh? Uh, and she scolds him. And she says, your father and I have been looking for you. And he corrects her. He said, I'm about my father's business. Guess who didn't get in trouble that day? What kind of parents leaves a boy at the house of God anyway? Huh? It's two days before they even, re you know, they, there's a day before they realize he lost a day back, and, it, you know, he's been gone from them two days. Well, what kind of parents were they? Anyway, we don't find out anything else about him until he's 30 years of age, and he comes on the scene to start his ministry. We know John the Baptist is the forerunner. He comes, he's preaching, baptizing people, preaching baptism as a remission of sins. We know that baptism won't save you from the sins, but it's a picture of what's about ready to come. And he tells them, there's one coming after me who's preferred before me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch it. About that time, Jesus comes down the river Jordan, and John proclaims him. He says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus gets John to baptize him. He says, no, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus tells him, and he permits it to be so. And John baptizes him. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? Because John is doing this under the law. Jesus had to fulfill the law. He had to get baptized so that the law would be fulfilled. He's doing everything that he's supposed to do. And upon coming up out of the water... That's when the Father proclaims him his beloved Son. That's when the Spirit falls on him in the form of a dove. And then Jesus goes to the wilderness and is tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And he comes out and he starts his ministry. Oh, let's talk about his ministry for a minute. Listen, we have four books about his ministry. There's a lot of things happened in his ministry. In Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7 is the great Sermon on the Mount. You can hear how Jesus preached and what he preached. And then throughout his ministry, he taught the people and he taught the scholars and he confounded them. And a lot of times when he dealt with common people, he'd use common things. He used what we call parables. He would use an earthly story to reveal a hidden heavenly truth. He knew how to deal with people on their level. And so... With all that information, it's hard to summarize what his ministry is other than what I've done. I want you to understand what was the mindset of Jesus' ministry. You know, the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. There's a lot of churches that don't ever do anything because they don't have any vision to do anything. Jesus came with perfect vision, what he was doing. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He came to this world to go to Calvary. He was in perfect tune with what his ministry should be. So what was the mindset of his ministry? Luke 19.14 tells us. Or I'm sorry, Luke 19.10 tells us. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came for sinners. He came to make a way that we could go to heaven. Brother James sings that old Henson song, Mercy Build a Bridge. He came to make a bridge from earth to glory. And we say, what's the bridge constructed of? Him. Hmm? His mindset of his ministry is that he came seeking to save that which was lost. What was the message of his ministry? Again, we can look at a lot of his preaching, but his message can be summarized in this one verse, Luke 13, 3. He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The message of his ministry is turn from your ways to his way. Repent. If you don't repent, you're going to perish. And then we could talk about the miracles of his ministry. Jesus didn't do miracles so that one day we could have faith healers run around here. The Greeks sought after wisdom. The Jews sought for a sign. Jesus did miracles to prove to the Jews he was the one that was prophesied of in the Old Testament. 
So he gave sight to the blind. By the way, Isaiah 35 tells us the only one that could do that is the Messiah. Isn't it amazing? Benny Hinn never gives anybody back their sight. The only one who can. Jesus. Hmm? Uh, we know that on three occasions he raised the dead. We know that he took people that had crippled afflictions, whether it's a withered hand or a halt in their, in their legs or whatever, uh, uh, people that were bedridden, and he would tell them to take up their bed and walk. The man with a withered hand had it stretched forth, and his hand was made whole. We know he took just a few loaves and a few fishes and fed the multitude. We know one woman uh, uh, for 12 years spent all that she had uh, 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 and she got nothing better but worse. Uh, uh, she had an issue of blood, but all she had to do was touch the hem of his garments and she was made whole. Can I say all manners of disease, all manners of anything that people had, Jesus healed them all, the Bible says. Nobody ever came to Jesus and left the same way. And can I say, in this day and age, nobody comes to Jesus by faith and stays in their sin and stays the same way. He'll change your life. Hmm? We find His miracles of His ministry. And there's many of them. Read the Gospels, you'll see them on every page. But then I want to conclude with His works. We know about His ministry, but what's His works? Well, first of all, there was the work of creation. John 1, 3 tells us, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, when I was young and just starting to learn about the Bible and start reading, I just figured God the Father made everything. He's the Father. No. John tells us Christ made everything. He formed the worlds with His speech. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, he made the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea and, and the beasts of the field. He made them all. He's the one that formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed in him the breath of life. Every creative act was done by Jesus Christ. And friend, he made you. There's the work of creation. Can I say this? There's the work of Calvary. Luke 23, 33. And then when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. He was suspended between two thieves on a hill called Calvary. In Hebrew, it's called Golgotha. The place of the skull. The, you say, what, what work could be done at Calvary? the redemptive work. You see, Hollywood would make you believe that nails held him on the cross. We're talking about God here. Man couldn't do what he's about ready to do. Matter of fact, just before he went to Calvary, he went to this place called the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter and James and John saw the man part disappear and they saw him in his glory. Because he's about ready to do the most glorious thing that could ever be done. You see, he did the work of Calvary. The work of Calvary was not the torture that they gave him in the hall praetorium where they beat him beyond recognition. Isaiah 52, 14 says his visage was marred much more than any man. In other words, he was beaten so badly he didn't even look like a man and nobody had ever been beaten that badly. Isaiah also tells us they plucked the beard from his face. They platted his head with a crown of thorns and peeled the very skin from his brow. They had tied him, Brother Brian, to whipping posts and they beat him to where he prophesied, and in Psalm 22, he said, My bones stare at me. They'd rip the flesh off of him, the muscles off of him. The paintings with the little blood coming from his hands and his feet and his side. No, he looked like hamburger meat slapped on a canvas with red dye just gushing everywhere. It was an absolute bloody mess. A human being couldn't endure the torture he went through 
The average man, it took them three or four days to die on a cross. What they'd do is they would push themselves up and get a grasp of breath, and they'd go back down, and they'd have to push themselves up to get breath. And what they would do is after uh, they felt like it was uh, inhumane, they'd come and they'd break their legs so they couldn't push up anymore, and they'd drown in their own fluids. Jesus hung on the cross six hours. When he seen all things were fulfilled, he said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. They didn't kill him. He laid down his life for you and I. No wonder that centurion soldier saw all that he went through and heard what he had to say from the cross, and he said, this, truly, this was, this man was the Son of God. The work of Calvary was the work of all ages. While he'd been hanging there for about three hours, the father then, to fulfill Isaiah 53 and verses 5 and 6, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. He looked ahead in time. He saw Tommy sin. That sorry, no good Tommy Handorf, all the filth that would come out of your mouth, all the filth that would flood through your minds, all the uh, uh, filth that your feet would run to do, everything that you would ever do, he saw it. And God said, I'll put his sins on my son. And not only Tommy. Everyone from Adam to whoever would be the last man that will be born of woman. Their sin was put on Jesus Christ. Colossians tells us he took the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. See, the Old Testament as we brought out and when we dealt with the scriptures was our schoolmaster. It brought us to the knowledge of sin. The law was given to show you could not be holy and you couldn't go to heaven on your own. And everything that you was guilty of was nailed to the cross. Taken out of the way. You see, he took your sin and he took the condemnation of the law from you and nailed it to his cross. And then while he is there hanging... All the imps of hell, because Psalms 22 tells us the bulls of Bashan encompassed him. Every imp of hell was there trying to kill him on the cross. Because if the devil could have killed him, then he wouldn't have gave his life. And he couldn't be our Savior. So in the midst of his agony, in the midst of this body, a, a hemorrhaging and about ready to collapse under its own account. Uh, it took power from the glory world uh, uh, for him to endure all of that. He kept his body alive just long enough. He took your sin and your shame. He took the law that proclaimed you guilty and he fought every imp of hell. And when he looked up and he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because the Holy Father can't look on anything unholy. And at that moment, Jesus was the most unholy thing that has ever existed. When all sin has now been imputed unto him. He endured it. And when he saw the Father's will was pleased, he said, It is finished and he gave up the ghost and he died because the Bible said cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree and he said a corn of wheat must die that it bring forth much fruit and he died Nicodemus the same Nicodemus in chapter 3 who came to him by night a religious man Shows me religion won't get you to heaven. Nicodemus comes to him and says, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. He said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, You must be born again. Well, Nicodemus paid real close attention because Nicodemus went and begged for the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea got the body of Jesus and took it and put it in Joseph's own tomb that never had had a man lay in it. They sealed it with a stone the Romans did because they said that deceiver said that he'd raise again isn't it amazing his own disciples didn't remember that he said he'd raise again but 
The devil's crowd remembered that. They said, unless some of his disciples come and steal him away, let's seal it away. So they put a stone over the tomb and two Roman centurions. Huh? Say, what happened? Hell was having a party. They thought they got him. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely a, a, a joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory going on in the charred regions of the dam. Satan thought he was about ready to go to assume the throne of Christ because the Son of God's dead in the tomb. Hmm? The Jews put forth a decree to all of his disciples. We find you, you're next. There's fear on that next Thursday. Because he died on Wednesday. I know religion celebrates on Friday. You can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. Especially since they weren't on a 24-hour day. They went sun up, sun down. Hmm? Uh, he died on Wednesday. Thursday came. Friday came. Saturday came. They's having a time. But thanks for God, Sunday came. First light, Sunday morning. The stone was rolled away. The keepers, the guards, quaked and shook and fell as dead man as the Son of God walked out of there under His own accord because the work of Calvary was now finished. He died according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. There was the work of Calvary. You see, He died for your sin, but He rose again under His own power to show that you and I, even though we may die in the flesh, if we die out to sin, my dear friends, one of these days we'll raise a newness of power, a newness of life, the grave didn't hold him, it won't hold us. Hallelujah. Hmm? There's the work of Calvary. He came to go to Calvary so you and I could go to glory. He died for our sin. Buddha didn't die for your sin. Muhammad didn't die for your sin. James Jones didn't die for your sin. The Harry Christian crowd didn't die for your sin. Are you listening? Mary didn't die for your sin. Hmm? Mary gave one commandment in the Bible. said, whatever Jesus says, you do it. Hmm? Uh, he died for your sin to be your Savior. There's the work of creation, the work of Calvary, and then there's the, His celestial work. I'll read you three verses. I'll be done. What's He been doing since He went back to heaven? Well, Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's our intercessor. You know why we pray in his name? Well, first of all, he said anything we, we'd pray in his name, his Father would do it. But he intercedes. Every time we pray, we pray to God through Jesus. He takes our prayers to God. And there's another equation called the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 8 says that the Holy Ghost intercedes... Uh, with groanings which cannot be heard. There's sometimes, you ever try and say something, don't come out right? Well, the Holy Ghost takes what's really what's in your heart, takes them to Jesus. He filters it out for what's the will of God, takes it to the Father, and then the Father does the will of God in your life. He's our intercessor. He intercedes. Hmm? What a blessing. But He's not only our intercessor. First John 2, 1 says, My little ch ch children, these things write unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's not only my intercessor, he's my advocate. That means uh, uh, any time we got sin in our life, if we'll confess it, forsake it, he goes to the Father and says they've turned their heart uh, and we're right with God again. Uh, also, any time Satan comes before the throne of God to accuse the brethren, because that's what he does, uh, and he begins to accuse you, uh, talks about that Clint Howe Jr., what a sorry, no good, look at him, uh, he ought to, he's up there singing, uh, but he ought to be uh, 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 underneath the building because he's lower than a snake's belly and he's just blasting out all kinds of things and venom about Clint. About that time, uh, uh, our Savior, the Advocate, stands up uh, and he says, But Father, uh, and the Father says, What? Uh, he's engraved in the palm of my hand. Uh, he's robed in my righteousness. Uh, he advocates for us. Uh, and the Father says, uh, uh, Hey, uh, he's innocent. Uh, and he's justified uh, as if he'd never even been a sinner. 
He's our intercessor. He's our advocate. And then hallelujah. The Bible lets us know in Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest. He's our priest, hallelujah. That is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Friend, he knows what you're going through. Huh? He said, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's our high priest. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he's got the remedy. We see his celestial work. And hallelujah, one of these days he's coming back to rule and reign. And we're coming with him. My question is, is he your Savior? He is the Savior. Is he your Savior? The preacher I've been saying, wonderful. That's a blessing. But how do you treat the Savior? How much do you appreciate him? Do you appreciate him enough to live for him? Do you appreciate him enough to allow him to use you to impact somebody else for his glory? Is he your Savior? And if so, are you proud of him and is he proud of you? Those are the questions tonight. Do you know him? If you don't know him, Everything I described about him, he went through and would have went through it if you'd have been the only one. He loves you that much. And he wants you to be in a relationship with him. He created you in the womb, but he wants to have fellowship with you. Wants to have a relationship with you. And the only thing keeping you from having that is your pride and your sin. So all you have to do is come and ask him to forgive you, and he will. And you'll have a relationship with the Creator. If you, if you know Him, are you proud of Him enough to let others know? And is He proud of you and the life you're living? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Father, come, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thanks to listeners and our Savior. Lord, I'm thinking about that song I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. God, you saved me from my sin. I'm thankful for that. Lord, there are days I don't make you proud. Forgive me of that. But there's never been a day I'm not proud of you. Help us, Lord, to share you with a lost and dying world. Lord, I don't know anybody's heart in here tonight. There may be some here tonight that are church members, but they've never been saved. Lord, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. There may be some in here tonight, Lord, they, they just know they're lost. And they need to get born again. I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Lord, there may be some of your children in here tonight, saved, going to heaven when they die. But Lord, their life isn't pleasing unto you. I pray tonight they'd get it made right. God, take our feeble efforts, our feeble abilities, but the message tonight about the Savior and touch people's hearts and we'll bless you for what you do for it's in Jesus wonderful name we pray Amen Thanks to listeners like you IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel If you haven't already, subscribe today and as always, thanks for listening